Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of Govs on the Go Faculty Spotlight, a podcast featuring faculty in the College of Arts and Letters here at Austin P. State University. My name is Dr. Buzz Hoon, Dean of the College, and I'm the host of the podcast. Today I'm talking with Talon Beeson, Associate Professor of Acting and Directing in the Department of Theater and Dance. And Talon, so great to have you on uh, today's podcast. Thanks so much for having me. Looking forward to it. Well, uh, we have lots to talk about, and we have uh, spent some time warming up talking yeah. about because we have many uh, very similar interests, and, and I tell you, I, I'm interested to hear all about your work in voiceover, but mm -hmm. let's, uh, let's begin with finding out about how we were fortunate enough to get you to come here to Austin P. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, well, I was, uh, I was narrating a TV show in L.A. I had been there for eight years, and uh, we had just had our highest ratings of ever. The show's been on since the 50s, uh, Divorce Court, the TV show. Um, and we had an Emmy nomination. And then the owner of the show decided she wanted to completely revamp and do it in a different style, which actually this new style was great, so no complaints. But everyone was fired except for the judge and the bailiff. <laughs> and we had, my wife and I had just had a baby. She was just under one at the time, Indigo. Oh. Mm -hmm. And we looked around and had this wonderful job and this great apartment in LA and everything was great. And all of a sudden we had nothing. Mm. So we're like, oh, what do we do? Um, we decided to make the move to academia. Um, and I got a couple of jobs in Chicago teaching at three different universities. And uh, my wife's family owned a condo in Cincinnati. So we decided that we would move to Cincinnati and I would commute to Chicago. So I did that for four days. I would drive up Sunday, come back Thursday, and then Austin P. I got the job at Austin P. And I was like, oh, great. We can live in a place where I don't have to commute six hours <laughs> oh, yes. and, and just do the thing that we do. Uh, so I ended up here, and it's just been a great six years since then. Oh, that's so, great. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about some of the classes that you teach sure. uh, for uh, the Department of Theater and Dance. And one of the classes that you said you you like to do is movement. Can yeah. you talk about that class? Yeah, I, I love that class. Um, the, the big reason I love that class is because uh, my undergraduate degree was in music theater. And so I had four years of dance classes. But it was, I mean, they were dance classes, like technique and all the things. And so when I left my undergraduate training, I didn't feel comfortable as a physically based actor. It was very mental and very like technique dance. Um, and then when I got to my graduate studies at DePaul University, it was a three year program in basically viewpoints, which is a physical devising technique. Um, not only did I lose like 30 pounds because I was <laughs> okay. sweating all day, every day, but it, it took my biggest weakness at the time, which was physicality of mm -hmm. performance and turned it into my strong suit. Um, and so when I got here and I was assigned the movement class, I thought, oh, great. I can take my graduate level training in viewpoints and Suzuki, which is, well, I'll mention that in a second, <laughs> and, and put it on these undergrads. Um, and so it, I love watching the students realize that acting is not here, that it's, that it's all of it, you know? And watching them discover their bodies and realize that there's nothing wrong with using their bodies. Uh, because we're taught from a very young age that, you know, ooh, we don't, we don't want to think past the chest. Right. Uh, that's, that's scary area down there. And, and it's not. I mean, your center of balance and your center of gravity is in your pelvis. But we don't like to talk about our pelvis. <laughs> it's a scary area. Um, and to watch them grow through that, mm -hmm. it's just amazing. Well, yeah. you know, it, it is just as we're going to talk about using your voice in a different mm -hmm. way, but I think that, that using your body mm -hmm. in, for some people, and it would be me as well, to, you know, understand it seems like it would be a higher level mm -hmm. of, of order in terms of communication. Right. Oh, yeah, certainly. Um, something that we actually cover in my Voice for the Actor class and in movement, which is kind of the second level of that, is the idea that your voice doesn't live here. Right, like you can resonate from your toes, from your knees, from your pelvis. Your your breath center needs to come all the way down and all the way back up. It doesn't live in your lungs. So uh, that that idea, mm -hmm. right, of embodying the voice and letting it be anywhere it needs to be in your body to make a different sound, 
it's really important and not something that a lot of people think about. So the other class that we're yeah. going to talk about is the voiceover performance class. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so um, I'm sure you have a lot of students to come in uh, that may have natural talent or even, mm -hmm. uh, you know, need to work on a specific uh, uh, area a little mm -hmm. bit more than others right. how do you how do you work all those different styles in, into uh, your teaching right uh, so in the voiceover class in uh, in particular I break it down into three different styles uh, four different styles we don't spend long on promo but we do it uh, we start with commercial because it's the biggest it's the biggest area in voiceover where, where a performer can make money and we talk about the seven and a half voiceover archetypes. And if you can do these seven and a half styles of voiceover, you can book any commercial. Um, they're a uh, regular guy, Selly, announcer, hospital, fun, celebrity, and I said hospital already, and another one that I'm forgetting at the moment. <laughs> uh, but I wrote about it in my book. And then I, I wrote a book called Starting Your Career in Voiceovers and lay it all out in there, right? So we start with that. We do that the first half of the semester. And then we move on to narration styles. Mm -hmm. So narrating a documentary, a television show, things like that. Um, and then we move into promo very, very quickly. Promo like radio identification, um, tonight on two and a half men, that kind of thing. And then we move into animation and video game styles. Um, and we've got motion capture suits that we get the students in because that's becoming such a huge part of the industry. Hmm. So we kind of break it down in voiceover into just these four areas and say, if you can master these styles and do what, we call, what I call the one read, which is you can walk up to a microphone, do a commercial and it can go in the air tomorrow. Now with direction, obviously it'll get better, but if you understand the style of a commercial, the commercial theory, it's good to go. You can just do it and one take be done. Um, and so by breaking it down that way, I make sure that the students leave with the ability to really nail that one read and at least understand the style of a hmm. commercial compared to a television show or a film or a stage work or something like that. Wow. And I would imagine that you, you would uh, have uh, some really great stories of, 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 or examples of students that have uh, grown in such a, a, mm -hmm. a wonderful way yeah. after they've learned how to incorporate those things into uh, how they perform. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, watching them book is always great right? because I have a lot of students that something that we always talk about in the department is uh, we want you working while you're in school. You should be auditioning for professional work oh. while you are here. Um, and our students book all the time. And I'm very gratified when they come to the voiceover class and that first day they're like a baby deer yeah. and trying to walk in a commercial and they're falling all over the place and not really sounding like a commercial. And then by the end of the semester, they book their first commercial. It's always very exciting. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So you mentioned your book, yeah. and, and uh, you must have seen some uh, need for that, that mm -hmm. there was a, a lack. And, and so talk about how you developed the book and, and right. uh, how it's used. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so uh, I wrote the book because I, I noticed I was read by William Morris um, in L.A. when they still had a voiceover department. They've since shuttered it. And um, I noticed even in these like top level working voiceover performers that they didn't understand how commercials worked, which is the bread and butter of, of our job. And it's also the, the thing that is almost easiest because once you understand how it works, it's easy to do. And I would go in the booth with these people and especially celebrities, like I'm not gonna throw any names under the bus, but we used to hate it when celebrities would come in to read because <laughs> instead of our normal 15 to 20 minute wait, Sometimes we would have to wait two to three hours while the celebrity figured out how to do a commercial. So I looked around and saw that no one was, a lot of people didn't know how to do this. And so I said, well, there should be some sort of like theory mm -hmm. or, or written rules. Like these are what commercials sound like. And it just didn't exist. It wasn't a thing. We have all these different types of acting theory and movement theory and dance theory and voice theory, but no commercial theory. And so I said, well, I'm going to do it. 
Um, someone's got to do it. It needs to be written down. So I sat down and started writing the rules of commercial theory. Um, and as I did that, it developed into the seven and a half archetypes, which then pointed out to me that if you can read Shakespeare, you can read commercials. Because when copywriters write, they usually follow Shakespeare first folio technique rules. They don't realize they're doing it. Hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, they probably don't realize <laughs> Yeah, exactly. They, they don't really realize it, but that's all right, because they do. You right. know? And so if you can follow the rules of Shakespeare first folio technique, you can read a commercial, write how the copywriter intended it to be the first time. So by the time I had gathered all this information, I realized that it was a normal sized book. And so I started writing and started shopping it around to publishers. Uh, and finally, Allworth Press got back to me and said that they would be happy to publish it and that I needed 20,000 more words. And no one's ever accused me of not using enough words. So I <laughs> sat down and said, sure, I'll, I'll write more words. Um, yeah, and it was a bestseller on Amazon for a bit. And then it started getting adopted as a textbook. I would imagine. Yeah, it was, it was, that was very exciting for me. Like the bestseller on Amazon was cool. That was, it was fine. But uh, when I started hearing that the very few voiceover programs in the country, um, it's usually just a minor. It's, I don't know of any voiceover majors. But when they started adapting it as their textbook, I was like, oh, well, that's, that's pretty neat. Yeah, I could see yeah. how it could be used in all types of different programs. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've, we talked about you know, the lot of similarities between uh, theater and music and broadcasting as right. well. Right, yeah. So, um, you know, one of the, uh, the, the wonderful things you do, you're a writer, you're a director, mm -hmm. you're an, also an actor, yeah. and I, I would like for you, if you could just talk a little, whatever you have been working on recently, if oh, you sure. can share some of the things, because I think that what that does is it adds so much credibility for our students to know, right. again, that you, uh, many of you in, in the areas, you're all working professionals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I've actually got a lot of things going on right okay. now. Just yesterday, I was able to announce uh, that I am the next book in the JTF 13 series, uh, Joint Task Force 13. Uh, I will be narrating that. This is the fifth book in the series, I think. Uh, it's a series about a military unit that has been around since the American Revolution and potentially before um, that deals with supernatural threats. Um, so the last one I did took place during World War I and it was about gremlins that had occupied a castle in Scotland and were just killing off military units. So JTF was sent in to deal with the gremlins. Uh, so this next one is called Legends and it's an anthology series. So it'll be just a bunch of different short stories set in that world. Uh, so that was just announced yesterday. Wow. Um, last week I was in Los Angeles for Lightbox Expo, which is an animation, uh, basically Comic-Con for animation, um, promoting my newest animated series that I'm in called Bit Wars, uh, in which I play Jitter, who is a giant blue monster who owns a uh, hot dog stand. You hide that well. Oh, uh, thank way. you, thank you. I, uh, I don't let him come out unless there's a full moon, and then all bets are off. Um, but yeah, I was doing that last week, and it went really well, made a lot of good contacts. They've had meetings with Disney, Hulu, Netflix, Cartoon Network, and Nickelodeon. Um, uh, so we're very hopeful that that's going to go to series relatively soon. Uh, the trailer actually just dropped. You can find it on Bit Wars Official on Instagram. Um, so, so I've got those going. I've also got an animated series about wrestling that I play the lead role in called Monday Night Mayhew. Uh, and I play Mean Mike Mayhew, who is a washed up wrestler who used to have the belt, but was kind of a jerk and ended up leaving and now just signs autographs. Um, but they bring him back into the wrestling federation to train his brother how to be a champion. Uh, so that's, that's in the background. Hopefully that'll come up soon and actually come to fruition. Wow, <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot of uh, things beyond <laughs> teaching and all the other responsibilities you have here. And, and it, it's been uh, just an impressive uh, talk with you. Mm -hmm. I appreciate your, your sharing some of your, not only uh, talents with, your, with our students, but uh, sharing part of your story today. It's been great catching up with you. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, thanks to all of our viewers and listeners out there for joining us. We will continue to profile some of the outstanding professors we have here 
in the College of Arts and Letters at Austin P. State University. So until next time, stay safe, take care, and God bless. Thank you.